Good morning. Good morning. The psalm that comes to mind is from the Psalms of Ascent. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I look forward to the day when I stand in the pulpit and I see many faces without masks. And as my, one of my favorite hymns was being played, I was tempted to sing, but we're not to sing yet. The time will come. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there also. So he's with us. He's here. We do have some announcements. Sue? Good morning. Wow. Um, I it is with sad news that I let you know that uh, Bill Williams has passed and um, the services are set up so that the, it's um, Saturday the 27th and uh, this coming Saturday and it'll be at Lord's, it'll be a viewing and May 1st here at the church there'll be uh, the burial at 1 o'clock and that was on emails so if you know somebody that does not get emails, please make sure that they know of this information. Thank you. Please keep Barbara and the family in your prayers. Three to five. Three to five. Thank you. There are other announcements? Well, I have one. I'm a bit behind times, of course, with my little cell phone, but uh, pushing the button to shut it off. Because as you know, I have been embarrassed by it going off. In fact, when I was here worshiping, and now it won't shut off. As we uh, move toward worship again, I'd like you to keep in mind the um, thought for worship, for preparation. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. I'm going to ask when we do go to worship, the call of worship is going to be from Psalm 100. It's found on page 520 in the Pew Bible, and I'm going to ask that you read it responsibly. I'll read verse 1, you'll read verse 2, I'll read verse 3, etc. So at this point, let me light the candles as a symbol of the light of Christ coming into our lives. Together, let us turn to Psalm 100. It is a psalm of thanks offering. Often read at Thanksgiving, but appropriate at any time. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. He is made us, and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. 
Let us pray. Well, Lord our God, we come before you on this day set aside to worship you. We come as those who have experienced your grace, your mercy, and your love. As those who have responded to the words of Jesus, follow me. And so we give you thanks for this time of worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. For we know that we are the church because we have a community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we belong to each other. And so, Lord, it is that we pray this day for those who cannot join with us in this place, asking for the day when we as your people again will gather here for worship. We pray for those who are ill and we ask for their healing. We pray for those who are confined because of this pandemic. We pray for Barbara Williams and her family at the death of her husband, Bill. We ask that the peace of the Holy Spirit dwell richly with Barbara and her family. We ask that the Holy Spirit would touch the lives of those who cannot gather with us on this day. And so it is that we pray that the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon us as we worship together, knowing that because we are gathered to worship, this place is holy ground. We ask your blessing upon us at this time of worship. And we now join together, praying the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. scripture lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If you uh, attended a church at one time that was either of the Episcopalian or Presbyterians or as I grew up in the United Church of Christ, we often follow the lectionary and this passage is taken from the lectionary for this day, the fifth Sunday of Advent, um, excuse me, of Lent. Paul's writing to the church that he loved, to a people that he loved. He's writing to a church, though, that is having some issues, especially with a small group within the congregation. Just before he wrote the words I'm about to write, he was writing about a friend in Christ and his concern, and he passes that on to the church. So that we pick up his letter in what is now the third chapter. So Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those manipulators of the faith. For if we who are circumcised, we who worship, by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. And here Paul begins to brag a little, if you will. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, and as for legalistic righteousness, flawless. 
but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the suppressing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For, those sa for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold for that which Christ Jesus took hold for me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining toward what is ahead. I press on the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenly in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the writings of Paul and his letter to the Philippian Christians. I now pray that the words I seek to share with my sisters and brothers in Christ might help us to grow in Christ. I humbly ask that this time together around your word will help to produce in us a God-centered life, a God-fearing heart, a God-honoring character. Amen. Well, as you uh, have read through the Gospels, I wonder if you noticed how often Jesus used visual aids in his teaching, in his sharing together. For example, you turn to the Gospel of Mark and Luke, you come to the visual aid of the widow who offers her pence, her equivalent of a one penny in the offering. And Jesus says she gave the greatest gift. There was a visual aid. And visual aids are used today in everything, in teaching and especially in preaching. So I have a visual aid for you today. Looking around this congregation, I'm sure every one of you know what this is. It comes from my age. Well, one, a couple of them, a lot younger than I am. It's a letter sweater, obviously. It's my letter sweater from my days in high school. The story behind the letter sweater goes back to a track meet in the spring of 1961, a long time ago. Our track team was on the way to a, a competition, and we were going to compete with what basically was thought the fastest track high school class in New Jersey. So on the way in the bus, all of a sudden, there's mumbling, and there's complaining, and a number of the members of the team wasn't agreeing with the coach. Uh, coach Walt said, we're going to win this track meet no matter what. I don't care what people say, how fast their runners are. But there were those who were mumbling. And as I sat there, uh, my only goal w was to uh, run either the half or the mile in, in place. And recognizing my ability, I figured at best I'd place in third place. So we go to the meet, we're all sitting there, 
It comes with a quarter mile, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, fall, you're going to run the quarter. And I got up and I looked at the coach. I said, coach, I run the half or the mile. Why the quarter? Why aren't you going to have the others run? He says, they're, they're complaining too much. They have no goals. They're not worthy of competing. Well, I said to myself, I guess I have to run it. I'll do the best I can. So uh, I ran the quarter. Of course, the rumor was right. The other team had fast members. The fastest member of the team runs right by me, comes to the finishing line, and he stops. The second member of his team come in first, so his friend could have a first. And then he steps across the line. The other member of my team ran third, and I ran fourth. And if you know anything about track, I didn't place. And yet, to this day, I believe I received my second letter because I made the effort to run. You see, I, I set a goal for myself. And it wasn't important to my coach how fast I ran the race. It was important for him that I ran the race and that I establish a goal. See, the coach, like Paul, in Philippians, wanted his team to have a goal. Now, the Judaizers, whom Paul was calling dogs, not a compliment by any stretch of the imagination, they had a goal, but it was contrary to what the coach, what Paul, what Paul thought God had set for the team. You see, they claimed that the non-Jew, and that would include all of us, could only come into the church through Judaism and then become a Christian. And Paul was against that. It was these individuals that Paul sets out in this part of Philippians to write to. He wants them to understand that they, they're really putting their trust and values in the wrong place. And he begins in a actually a very nice way. He writes, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now, the Greek here is actually saying, furthermore, my brothers, or in addition to my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He was encouraging them to rejoice in the Lord. For Paul knew by rejoicing in the Lord, their faith would be strengthened. They would be stronger in their faith. Likewise, the same is true for us. And so Paul continues to express this idea of rejoicing in the Lord. Philippians 4.4 4 reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And so Paul stressed this throughout his ministry. And at the same time, he was concerned about these individuals. He wanted them to know that you do not insist on some ritual form to enter the faith. Paul rebuked them and spoke of their failure. And their failure was that they failed to understand, to fully comprehend the glory and the beauty of the gospel itself. They failed to understand that the gospel speaks of grace, of the grace of a loving God who sent his only son. The call of the gospel is to faith, not to do some ritual or fulfill some ritual. And therefore, therefore, each of us who comes to that knowledge of Christ should rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. The lesson is the same for us today. We are to rejoice because it, the gospel is one of grace. The gospel is not one of works. There's no way that we can work our way into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. It is one of faith. The principles by which you and I live, the things that we do in the name of Christ, the services that we carry out, are the result of our faith. They're not a way 
to earn faith. And see here, Paul calls his readers, he calls you and I to examine just where our trust is. Where our trust is in terms of the values or value that we place on status and on power and on the symbols of success in our culture. Today, if we're honest about our culture, there are far too many people that believe that the things which they have are the measure of all things. That there are far too many people that think that they themselves are the measure of all things and there is nothing beyond them. Basically, there is no God. And so Paul addresses these false confidences that people have in these symbols of success and achievement. Paul recognizes this attitude of those who oppose his preaching and teaching about the grace and the mercy and the love of God. He told those Christians, he tells us that our confidence, as he told them, that their confidence must be in God. It's interesting if you know the Greek, and I'm not bragging, I just had to take Greek in seminary. So the Greek word for confidence here has, has the idea of a settled persuasion regarding something. So as the hymn goes, I am persuaded that he, God, is able to keep all things until that day. You see, our confidence is not in the symbols and not in what we achieved in life, but in Christ himself. And to demonstrate that point, as I said when I read the scripture, Paul listed out his things about bragging in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. These were the things that Paul was proud of as a Pharisee. But when he came to Christ, when confronted on the road to Damascus, he realized that these former things had no value. Paul had arrived. If you look at what he lists, he had arrived in the culture of his day. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was born of the best tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Roman citizen. He was well educated. He could speak Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. But all these things, he said, were nothing compared to Jesus Christ and compared to the mission, to the purpose for which Christ had called him. Professor David Wells at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary describes it this way in one of his very good books, Turning to God. Paul describes here that the noble values of the past are regulated to the status of garbage in comparison with the new values and aspirations found in Christ. Excuse me. Think of what that meant in that day. Think of what it meant to look at Paul and said, he's arrived. He's achieved great things, educated, a Roman citizen. Think what it means today. The fact that I graduated from an Ivory League college, retrieved status in my culture, can speak three language, means nothing for those of us who have claimed the name of Christ, who have faith, in Jesus Christ. Now be clear, it needs to be clear that Paul is not condemning these things. He's not condemning them at all. But he's putting them in their proper place for those who seek to be followers of Jesus Christ, who claim the name Christian. Paul simply is calling into question the very values and way of thinking in his culture, in his world at the time. And these words 
are a call for us as a Christian community to step back and to start to question the values and the changes in our culture. All the values. Paul's team, Christ's team, our team have different values and have different goals. Why? Because we name the name of Jesus Christ. Paul is writing to a people that he had a great joy in knowing. This is a congregation that loved him and that he loved. He writes to encourage them as they attempted then to live out their faith, to struggle with what it means to be a Christian in that culture among those who would have nothing to do with it. The struggle is the same today for you and I. Paul encourages us to grow in our faith, to move toward the goal of righteousness that comes from God through faith. His words, put no confidence in the flesh, are powerful. Yes, even Paul, like us, needed to continue to grow in his faith, needed to continue to learn to live in the power of the resurrection. One author wrote this, the experience of growing in Christ comes from gaining wisdom as we attempt to live in Christian principles. The power of the Holy Spirit is released in proportion to our growth in the understanding and in the practice of our faith. These principles are clearly spelled out for us as we discover them, as we read and study the scriptures. Principles learned as we share together in discussion and in fellowship and prayer with our fellow believers. In these times, we learn of what of the life in Christ is all about. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, even Paul admitted that in spite of the fact he had been a Christian for something some 30 years, he still needed to grow in his Christian faith. And so he wrote, not that I have already obtained all this, or I have already made perfect, but I press on to hold for what which Christ Jesus took hold of me, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The whole section of this letter is filled with Greek words that refer to an athletic event. Paul is writing in terms of the Christian life as a race, not the quarter mile I was attempting to run in college, I mean high school, and failed, but a marathon. For Paul, this race for Christ, this race is for Christ, and it takes a lifetime. Running this race, we must not fail to give our best. We must give our best. This race is not about winning and losing. It is about how we run the race. For the reality is that Christ has already won. The victory is his. Bill has inherited the victory of his faith. Paul calls his readers, you and I, to pursue life in a new direction, that of living for Christ. Paul understood clearly that he had a continuing responsibility to pursue the purpose for which Christ had chosen him, for which Christ has chosen us. Growth in our faith. Christ is here. And the imperative is that we as Christians must follow in the faith and continue to run the race. And Paul warns against self-complacency. You know, we often hear, I hear, 
I'm saved, it's great, I don't have to do anything. I'm a Christian, there's nothing more that I need to do. Paul declares that this is a de delusion. There's far more that we need to do. He expresses the need to press on in the faith. He uses the metaphor of the foot race to encourage us not to settle for the limitations of a mere existence in the faith, but to push on for the steadfastness of living for Christ. The metaphor of that foot race that Paul speaks of, forgetting what lies behind, is a strong Greek word. It has the idea of setting it aside only forgetting what lies behind. I looked up the phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, in a number of paraphrases. What paraphrase writes it? J.P. Phillips, it's an old paraphrase, writes it this way. I leave the past behind and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. I leave the past behind with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. My track school in college emphasized that you never look back in a race. You must always look ahead, keeping the goal before you. Much like if you're running a relay race and you have the baton in your hand, you don't look back to see who's behind you. You look ahead, you're stretching out your hand to hand off the baton to the next runner. To this point, Paul uses some very strong words for forgetting. It's, it's the idea of not being so absorbed in the past that it has all our attention, that it hinders us from progress in the faith. You do not look back like the relay runner that always looks forward. If we look back in a race, and if you run before, any time in your race, you know when you look back, it breaks your stride. It gets you caught up too much in a concern for the person behind you. Focus on running the race. You look forward. You always do better. And that freedom that we have to forget what is behind is given to us by Christ. He frees us. He enables us to forget our past achievements, and our past failures so that we can press ahead to the goal. And the goal for Paul throughout his writings and for us today is Christ. We are called to make an effort to learn more about our faith that we might achieve the goal of the fullness of Christ in our lives. What is pictured here for us, for the reader, is a faith that is active, a faith that is energetic, a faith that is vigorous, a faith that is fruitful. The Old Testament has many good words for us from the prophet of Amos. I share this word. Woe to them that are at at ease. It was a warning to Israel. It comes to us as well. Woe to them that are at ease. The Christian life is not one of ease. It is one of vigorous discipleship. Discipleship that includes but is never limited to the reading of scripture, the study of scripture, to fellowship, to fellowship with other Christians about the word, to times of prayer. You see, the goal is set before us, and toward it we all must go. The only real proof, if you will, of our faith is obedience and faithfulness. And so it is that the author of Hebrews wrote, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. It is a race of faith and obedience to grow into the fullness of Christ. It is a race of a lifetime. It is a race that draws us closer to Christ and to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fellowship of other Christians, for your word which you have shared for us. 
for this time together. He simply asks that we would heed to the words of the Apostle Paul and seek in our lives to run the race that is set before us. Amen. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God the Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.